the first thing to talk about then is let's take a look at some imagined play situation of heroic dark itself. And well, actually, yeah. but actually, before we before we dive into heroic dark, I think I just want to see if we can talk about examples because you were, you know, hit. Oh, I, I, pe- I piqued your curiosity a little too much, did I? All right. Yeah, I mm-hmm. I, I want to know examples of games that that do what you're describing well. Okay. Well, um, one of the most interesting, and and remember, this is highly, highly setting and concept specific. So if you're the, the, this particular example, so it's not easily applicable to any other setting that I can think of. So that's the first thing is that I'm not proposing anything in this example I'm about to give. It's not a generic one. There is a game called Zero in which your characters are cyborg hive mind uh, beings or humanoids who have inadvertently broken free of their hive mind. And their only background is that of being in this hive mind and for their specialized place in the society. And you are uh, allowed to pick a number um, from uh, two to nine and you and that becomes your number and you get that many um that's called your focus number and you get that many focus skills uh you also get uh you also get some non-focus skills and some untrained skills but the point is that to at first it seems as though you want to have a high focus number um let's see if i'm no no a low focus number because you have to take two dice and roll your number over in order to succeed Mm -hmm. and for your other skills you have to roll over to succeed it's only in your uh no it's it's your unfocused skills you have to you have to have under or succeed so really since the numbers explode as well on the dice rolling high is a lot easier so therefore, you say, oh, good, I want to have a nice low focus number with only a few focus skills, and I'll be very effective. Um, or you can decide to have a few more skills, and you can have, therefore, more skills, but it's they're slightly harder to succeed in all the way around. Um, this is very deceiving because you can change your number in uh when you know at certain times by spending experience points but really as you can see you aren't really changing your effectiveness very much you're just narrowing and broadening it for your focus skills Mm -hmm. so that's not really the advancement system you can sort of change that up if you want what's interesting is that you can also buy more untrained skills that you're allowed to buy. So you can broaden yourself, and the higher your number, the better are you at with the untrained skills. In other words, the less focused you are. Um, And um, what's especially important is that these characters have been thrown into uh, a, a highly alienated, individualized state for the first time in their lives. And they are telepathic. They can communicate with each other but they can't communicate with the hive mind anymore. So you have sort of your automatic party of neonates who are terrified of being alone. The whole weird thing with Zero is that after a little while playing, your characters are able to make new skills that pertain to their new lives, which are up to the players to invent. So, therefore, the characters are becoming more and more individualized and, for lack of a better word, human, as they may pick up all kinds of skills that are immediately relevant to them and to one another um, that have no resemblance to anything on the actual skill list of what they might have had from the hive. Mm -hmm. So, what's interesting is that, therefore, as they become more and more and more human, To be more effective with those skills, their focus number goes up rather than down. 
So it's the opposite of what was effectiveness in the hive. What was effectiveness in the hive was um, focusing, right? You get focus skills, and the lower your number, the better are you are, the better at them you are. Whereas here, now your focus skills are kind of like your your superpowers. You know, you used to be a warrior back at the hive, so you are a real badass with the gun. But you have all these broader skills now. You're a different person. You have a, you're completely not defined by being part of the hive anymore after a while. And you let your focus number drift up because now you can be more effective with all of those. So you're no you're still, you know, you're no longer superhumanly effective with the gun, and you're no longer superhumanly effect you know, you 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 are only what you might think of as ordinary role playing game effective with the skills you've amassed. Mm -hmm. And so the whole language of focused versus unfocused skill just kind of goes away for purposes of the game and um, for purposes of your character. But So therefore what I'm saying is your character in Zero undergoes change that you get experience for and you do buy skills with, but it is a much more a matter of breadth and actually a matter of increasing your abilities with those, un I mean, your, your score with those untrained skills, but it will never increase to the extreme levels that you had with your focused skills back in the hive. So pound for pound, in terms of dice probabilities, you've become a less effective character. Mm -hmm. But you are still pretty effective in sort of ordinary human terms, and you're vastly more broad based on skills that you, the player, have decided would be the things your character would be learning and internalizing as they grow up, grapple with the realities of using their own personal senses and using, you know, figuring out, you know, that uh, the hive is not the universe mm -hmm. and coping with all sorts of things that, uh, that are are very 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 alien to them and more familiar to the players um so do you see how the idea of improvement by simply getting more and more and more effective more and more and more durable isn't actually what the advancement system of zero is about right so now that's as i say that's a highly specialized example but it's a really good one um, and it's also interesting to read old reviews of Zero and see that the reviewers are completely not getting it, even a little. Because you don't develop that understanding of the game except through play. You're not going to, you know, you're looking at the advancement system and trying to think about how you go up in your effectiveness. And you're not seeing it. And you're like, this advancement system is broken, which is what all the reviews were saying. <laughs> in the case of... A game called The Shadow of Yesterday. Um, it was a little bit... <laughs> I, I hesitate to do it without a diagram because there's a lot of terms. But the way you get experience points is by satisfying or expressing the content of what are called your keys, which are behavioral principles. Mm -hmm. um, they were pretty do pretty nuanced. You had a couple, three keys, and each one is very nuanced with different layers. So that's a lot of things to pay attention to. So it's a very attention-heavy experience system. Say you have the key of, I'm not making this up because I'm not grabbing a copy off my shelf, but if you have the key of the liar, you would get a small amount of experience points, maybe one for telling a lie. Uh, you would get more, say three or five, by, um, you know, doing something really significant with a lie, some kind of, you know, lying about yourself. I'm Again, I'm making this up, you know. You know, we have one point for lying about external things. Get three points for lying about yourself. Um, and then every key also has a 10-point buy-off, which is when, in the case of, the, of such a key as I just described, it would be, a contradict they would all, they're all contradictory it's when you betray your key it's when you would say when you tell the truth for someone else's benefit or something like that yeah. then you have the option to suddenly get this gift of 10 experience points and you have to lose the key forever so um you can take new keys you can 
buy off keys, you can decide you're never going to buy off a key because you want to play a liar and you're having a great time and you're getting all these trickling in experience points that way. But the idea was to have an escape clause for any behavioral uh, any any behavioral win, uh, quirk or value that your character may have. Um, you're getting rewarded for using it, but you have an escape clause when it seems to you dramatic for your character to undergo a big change and say, I'm not going to be a liar anymore in that fashion. Um, but those experience points then are spent on improvement in the ordinary sense. So you can improve your skills, you can improve what are called your secrets, which are basically whole little power slash skill sets that are unique packages, or you can improve what are called your pools, which are the resources you spend to, to bonus up everything. when you. So, so those do bulk up. What's interesting is that if you, the, the, the re resolution system was finite in such a way that if you uh, had a maximum ability which was hard to buy up to. I mean, you would have had to really get a lot of experience points to buy up to maximum ability. And you rolled the maximum possible on your dice, which happens to be three pluses. If you did that and got a success of seven, uh, if I'm remembering correctly, maybe I've got the, the numbers wrong, but the point was whatever the, the skill ability was that was maxed plus three, if you rolled that amount, uh, then your character is, you have a transcendent moment, you're, that contest has totally, you know, uh, shown everybody what your character has done at the apex of their, you know, of their awesomeness, and it's time to stop playing that character. So, um, a lot of people had a lot of trouble with that. They were like, wait, a role can take me out of play? My most, and you're like, well, yeah, but you're not going to be, you're not going to be if you're at that level of mastery, maybe you ought to take a lot of thought on what kind of contests you want to get into. Is it worth taking yourself out of play to get into this? So what Clinton was doing, Clinton Nixon was doing with this design, in among other things, was to have you um, be as cautious about getting into contests at the top of your game as you were at the bottom of your game. At the bottom of your game, you don't want to get into conflicts because you don't want to get killed. At the top of your game, you don't want to get into contests that, unless it's worth it to you for the possibility of you transcending out of play. Um, so it, although the system looks like just an improvement system, the fact that there's that top end and the bottom end with those features and the fact that you've got that behavioral mechanism of generating the experience points in the first place makes it a very different system from just your ordinary, well, I start here and then I just get big. The getting big in yeah. this case is a, is, is, a, a, is a piece of the puzzle. Right. So I guess my question for that example is um, couldn't players just sandbag that system and avoid maxing their stats? Right, but there's nothing wrong with that. In other words, getting to a mastery level of your skills is uh, is is a choice, and that's Clinton's okay with that. He was like, you know, if you want to, if you're going to walk around with a max level in any of these skills, then you need to be a different kind of character than you were before, mm -hmm. and that's on purpose. And it was definitely by choice. You don't have to. It's not intended to drive you there. And you see, that was another thing people had trouble with when they criticized it. They they treated it as axiomatic that you had to want your character to reach the apex effectiveness. And so these were the same people who would take keys and then betray them instantly, get the 10 experience points, and dump them into skills. They're like, oh, I can fast track my way up with this. It's broken. This is awesome. And then they would be disappointed. They were saying, I didn't really enjoy my character. And like, well, big surprise. So, um, it, but it is, however, another example of how the character changing wasn't really the same 
as the character just getting bigger and bigger. In this case, it's getting bigger and bigger is part of a larger scheme of changes and of personality and profile that you've developed through the course of play. Um, now, as for some others, let me see. 